brings us to our, to our guest speaker, Dr. Paul Redding. Paul is a consultant neurologist at the James Cook Hospital in Middlesbrough and is head of the neurology sleep clinic there. Also in the past, he's been president of the British Sleep Association. So, obviously eminently qualified to talk to us about why sleep is so important. Okay, thank you, Mike. Okay, thank you, Mike, for the introduction, um, and thanks for turning out on this wintry, uh, wintry day. So, yes, I have a passion for sleep. It's my thing. I'm a rare species. Um, I'm a neurologist. My day job is sorting out sick brains. Um, uh, I'm a, quite a rare species. That there, there were three of us doing sleep from a neuro perspective when I started 17 years ago now. Uh, there are now 22 in the UK doing what I do, so we're still quite rare. Most sleep doctors are respiratory. They deal with breathing, snoring, people that stop breathing in their sleep. But we, we, we go from a, a brain angle, which I think is entirely appropriate. It's all about the brain sleep. Um, so sleep is my passion, as I said. Um, I'll just start this talk with this slide here. I would say that sleep is the second biggest unanswered question in the whole of neuroscience. Now, the big one is, what is human consciousness? What makes humans human? A good question for a humanist, I guess. But I think the second biggest question is why we sleep? Why do we spend a third of our lives in this bizarre state of, of, uh, of fake death, you might say? Um, we don't know. We don't know why we sleep, ultimately. Loads of unanswered questions, just a few here randomly dispersed on this, uh, on this graphic. We don't even really know how much we need. I'll address that in, in the talk. So it's important. We do it. it it's undervalued. Um, sleep is for wimps is a, a phrase attributed to, to Thatcher. Um, now taken on by Donald Trump, I think. Um, but it's not for wimps, it's incredibly important. And I want to try and sell you that notion. So I'm going to bang on about sleep. What is it? How do we define sleep? And a brief one slide on why we do it. One slide that gives you some idea of the theories of why we sleep. And we don't know, but there's some theories out there, some themes of why we sleep. How much do we need? Um, and one thing I want you to take home is not so much the quantity of sleep is important, it's the quality of sleep. So you can spend 10 hours in a rubbish sleep and feel, and feel bad in the morning. It's all about the quality, okay? So how do you define quality sleep? What happens when we don't get enough of it or enough good quality sleep? And this is, the, this is what most of the talk will be focused on. And if you don't get enough sleep, you'll be sleepy. That's a, a no-brainer, if you pardon the pun. But all, if we don't have enough sleep, other things happen. It can affect your mind, it can affect your body. And we'll just discuss some of the, 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 uh, the consequences of chronic lack of sleep. Um, a sad fact of life is that sleep changes through our, our lifespan. And normal, natural ageing uh, has a massive effect on our sleep quality. And um, I'll, I'll touch a bit on that. And then if there's time at the end, a couple of cases that I've, I see in my clinic, um, with some video examples of the sort of thing that I do in my day-to-day -day sleep clinic. So, um, I'll, I'll start with a few quotes. Now, it's a fact of life, a fact of nature, that every animal with a brain, and even without a brain actually, has to have a sleep. It has to have a sleep. You can't wing it. And there's loads of quotes out there. This one I quite like. Um, if sleep doesn't serve some vital function, it's the biggest mistake evolution ever made. So if we could evolve not to have sleep, wouldn't that be great? You know, 24-7 wakefulness, how productive would we be? But we can't, and we haven't. Every animal has to have a sleep period. This guy's quite famous in a, for a couple of reasons. He's famous for um, uh, inventing, if that's the right word, or first designing the the sleep staging, how we measure sleep on the brainwave tests. He also prov proved in the um, 1970s that rats would last two weeks without sleep. I mean, a very unsavoury experiment. But he slept deprived rats to death. And I might touch on that later on. So a bit of an infamous character in the sleep world. This guy, um, an unfortunate name you might say, but he's a bit of a hero. Um, he bred uh, dogs in Stanford in, in, the, in, the, in the States, uh, Dobermans actually, who had narcolepsy. These dogs had a sleep condition called narcolepsy. And analyzing these dogs, we now know loads about narcolepsy. And our quirky little quote, it's all about the brain. But actually, that understates it. It goes beyond the brain sleep. And my last little quote is a guy who was an, apparently uh, an American industrialist, an entrepreneur type. And he said, the best bridge for repair between despair and hope is a good night's sleep. And this, this underpins the idea that mental health problems, whether it be depression, anxiety, um, people think that will cause bad sleep. Yeah, it does, but bad sleep will fuel anxiety and depression. 
So if you sort out someone's sleep, there's a sporting chance you might sort out their mental health issues. This what's called a bi-directional relationship. And I think that's increasingly recognised in, in mental health circles in psychiatry, for example. Um, if this talk inspires you to read a bit about, a bit about sleep, I can't uh, recommend enough this book by Matthew Walker. Now, Matthew Walker's an interesting guy. He did his PhD in... Uh, in uh, in dementia, actually, uh, in Newcastle, back in around 2000, when I was starting off in sleep. I knew him quite well in those days. He's, he's done great things. He's now one of the world's most uh, influential sleep scientists. He runs a big lab in San Diego. Uh, he's a fantastic speaker. Um, really does perform well on stage. And he's written a book. It came out about two months ago, Why We Sleep. Um, he's on a world tour now, apparently flogging this book. It's a great book. Um, it's designed for the lay, for the lay public. It's quite meaty. Um, but it is, I think, understandable uh, with a bit of background knowledge. And I love his kind of uh, his fake flyer for sleep. Um, you know, if sleep was a drug, you'd want some. Um, um, but that book is a very good book. I, I can highly recommend it. I think it's about 10 quid of Amazon. So how do we define sleep? Well, one thing sleep isn't. It's just a lack of wakefulness. So people think, oh, going to sleep, like turning off the lights, we're just not awake. It's far more than that. Sleep is a very active process. So uh, at the very least, I want you to take home the idea that sleep things go on in sleep. It's not just uh, you know, turning off the lights. And we measure it. Um, we've been doing this for 60 years now. It's, it's pretty basic. We measure brain waves. Um, we measure snoring and breathing parameters. And we measure movements, uh, leg movements, and muscle movements in sleep. And, and by measuring these various um, uh, parameters, we come up with a graph. Now, this is called a hypnogram. And this is what we come out with. If you, if you have a, a night in our sleep lab, uh, this sort of graph is produced. And I'll just talk you through it. So these, this is hours through the night. So from eight hours is, would, would be the ideal, I guess. And these are sleep stages. And you'll probably be aware that we cycle through different sleep stages. So we start awake here, and then we sink into what's called deep non-REM sleep. Uh, this is the good stuff, OK? Um, I'll come back to why it's good. And we have REM sleep. Now, REM sleep stands for rapid eye movement. Your eyes are wobbling away like the clappers, um, and this loosely corresponds to dream sleep. So all, all our uh, narrative, bizarre dreams, nightmares even, will come from REM sleep. Um, now, we all have REM sleep, but we, people say, oh, I, I never dream. Well, you do, but you don't remember them. Because you only remember a dream if you wake up in the middle of a REM sleep period. So this kind of mythical uh, person here would have a dream here, but not here, here, or here. Um, we spend half the night in light sleep, what's called stage two non-REM sleep, and we define this by these little wiggly lines from the brainwave test. But the good stuff is this. Now, if you measure this on the brainwaves, you see these big, striking uh, brainwaves. They're called delta waves. They're quite striking when you see them. And this is the good stuff. So if you get 90 minutes of this through a, a nighttime sleep, there's a good chance you'll feel refreshed in the morning. Uh, similarly, if you don't get enough of this, this, you won't feel refreshed. And there's loads of things out there that will degrade what I would call good sleep, this sort of sleep, to this sort of sleep, light sleep. Uh, and we'll come back to that. But this is the important stuff, the good stuff. And we have most of this in our in the first maybe two hours, three hours of sleep. Um, and that's called slow wave sleep, or deep non-REM sleep. Uh, REM sleep is a different ball game. So in REM sleep, as you might imagine, our brains are going like the clappers having vivid dreams, nightmares. A completely different state of affairs to the deep non-REM sleep. So that essentially is what we aim to get when we go to bed. We, we cycle through these REM and non-REM uh, periods. And our dreams all mostly occur towards the end of the night, actually. That's when we have most of our dream sleep. So why do we do it? Um, just one slide to summarise decades of research and theories. Um, and there are two main themes of sleep research as to why we do it. There's the, the kind of what I call the metabolic theory of sleep. And this is, gives the idea that sleep is restorative. We feel better, we feel restored after a good night's sleep. We are de detoxified, and there's some evidence for that, actually, at the cellular level. Um, uh, we recover from cellular stress. So I'm going into, into the details, but this does seem to happen. We are restored uh, at a cellular level by sleep. Uh, the other main theory is, is more to do with memory. So during sleep, we, we, form me we consolidate memories. Um, and you may be aware of the word synapse, these, these junctions between nerve cells. And there's quite good evidence that in sleep, these these junctions are pruned or downscaled to make them more relevant and to kind of consolidate memory. So memory consolidation, especially emotional memory consolidation, is a major theme of, of sleep and why we do it. Um, so just to give you an idea of what people are thinking. So it's, it's restorative, 
yet memory consolidation is also probably happening, an active process. So how much do we need? Um, people know who that is? The pony, yeah, um, the pony. Looking a bit sleepy, it must be said, at um, being drawn at the opera. Now, um, Napoleon allegedly said this, um, and this would be, could be straight out of a Donald Trump tweet, couldn't it? But um, so uh, Napoleon wasn't, was a notorious short sleeper. He was a four-hour four hour night man, even though he looks a bit sleepy here, to be, to be fair. And um, you know, this idea that sleeps for wimps has been with us you know, for probably for uh, centuries. Um, so Napoleon was a bit of a baddie from a sleep, in the sleep world. Now, this, this guy was a real baddie. Does everyone know who that is? Edison, yeah, heard, heard that. So Edison. So this guy is as bad as it gets from a sleep perspective. So he came out with this rubbish. Um, so it was a waste of time in here from our cave days. Now he was another famous short sleeper. He'd have he, four hours a night, um, but he would have long naps in the afternoon, two hours naps in the afternoon. And even he said he got all his creative genius from his daytime naps. So what was that genius? Well, he's credited with inventing the light bulb, but we all know that Joseph Swan down the road actually invented it. He stole the idea. <laughs> so um, not only was he uh, uh, a charlatan from a, a sleep perspective, he, he stole ideas as well. Uh, and there's a big biopic coming out on him this year, I think. I'd be interested how they portray him vis-a-vis -vis his, uh, his sleep habits or lack of habits. So Ellison, a real baddie. Um, a bit of science here, but it, it's quite... A simple bit of science. Um, I mentioned this guy, Rex Chaffin, who slept deprived rats to death. Now, horrible thing to do to rats. In fact, some did it to puppies, can you believe, in 1890. Um, but in this sort of torture chamber, you have a rat here and a rat here. And this rat's been monitored for sleep. And whenever it goes to sleep, this thing rotates and this rat gets plunged into cold water, so it never gets any sleep. And the other rat is what's called the control rat. So this rat also gets dunked a bit, but not contingent on sleep. So it gets some sleep, at least. Now, this rat will die in two weeks. Um, and you can deprive it of REM sleep and do all kinds of horrible things, but the rat will die. So you need sleep. You, you, you will die if you don't get enough sleep. You might ask, how do you die, apart from horribly? Um, and it's not clear, but all your organs pack up. Multi-organ failure. You have lots of signs of inflammation. You have sepsis. Uh, these rats lose a massive amount of weight despite eating lots of food. They can't thermoregulate. They have fits. Um, although when you look at the brains, there's nothing obviously wrong with the brains under the microscope, but there's clearly they are not functioning at all well and they die. Um, they die horribly. So, next question, what about humans? Uh, one dress to think what happened in the likes of Auschwitz, but um, uh, I came across this fairly recently, this, uh, this Chinese um, review from the 1850s. So, a bit wordy, but this, essentially the Chinese, bless them, uh, they used this method of sleep deprivation to kill someone, a, a capital punishment. And the bottom line is, this poor guy lasted for 19 days before he, he died. And it's a pretty horrible way of going. So this is, this is our, our, our best guess as how long you can go without sleep before actually dying. 19 days. But just makes the point that you, you, without sleep, you die. It's an absolutely f fundamental, vital uh, fu uh, uh, function. So a bit about triggers for sleep. So I, again, again, banging on about how important sleep is. But it's like <coughs> hunger and thirst. Uh, it builds up. So without sleep, we become sleepier and sleepier and sleepier. Uh, we have a sleep debt, you might say. And the, but the only thing that can repay this debt is sleep itself. You can't wing it. You need to have sleep to repay your sleep debt. Like hunger, like thirst, it's an absolutely vital, primitive drive state. Um, I, I'm not going to bang on about the clock, but the, we have clocks in our brains that are really important as well in terms of sleepiness. Uh, you may be familiar with our natural clocks. But there's a tiny bit of the brain, really deep in the brain. It's only a few thousand brain cells out of 10 billion. But this is our ultimate internal clock, and this ticks away 24-7. And... No matter what we've done through the day or night, we would naturally be sleepier at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and about 4 o'clock in the morning. You know, the afternoon nap scenario is, 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 a, is, a, is a natural function due to our internal clocks. And, and everything has a clock function. So any, you pick anything, temperature, um, hormone production, it will have a ryth rhythmicity to it, governed ultimately by this tiny little clock deep in the brain. One thing you might not know is that these clocks actually are set at 25 hours in humans usually. So... Um, uh, if it was left to run in, in, a, in a dish or in a lab, your clocks would be on a 25-hour cycle. So what happens is, in a natural um, uh, environment, the light, the daylight cycle, 24 hours, in trains is the word that's used, in trains are clocks to 24 hours. So without light, if we're blind from birth, for example, uh, we will run on a 25-hour clock. And this happens in real life. So we see people who are blind who have real problems adjusting to a conventional sleep-weight cycle. They, every day, they sleep an hour later, and that causes problems, as you might understand. Um, 
Now, this is a, a bit of science here. I hope I don't blind you with science, but this was, I think, a pivotal study that was done in the States. And uh, these were young, healthy, uh, student-type people in their 20s. And they were in a sleep lab for 14 days and nights. So a bit of, a, bit of an ordeal, I guess. And they were exposed to this test. It's called a psychomotor vigilance test. Now, this is a test of drowsiness. It's really boring. It's supposed to be boring. Um, it's supposed to... <coughs> be a, a marker for drowsiness. So you, you basically you look at a computer screen or a radar screen and you've got to spot blips. Blip here, blip there, blip there. It's incredibly tedious and the first side of drowsiness will be you either miss a blip or you'll be a bit slow to react to a blip. So these lapses here are a key measure of drowsiness. Now the experiment had four groups to it. So these people were given the luxury of eight hours sleep a night um, and it's actual sleep, they were measuring it, so at, not just time in bed, actual sleep. There's a six hours a night group and a four hours a night group and a no hours a night group. So three days of no sleep at all. Um, and what was surprising was that the six hours of sleep night group, these are young fit people, you think you can wing it six hours, you, you know, you can get by with that. But on these te this test of drowsiness, these lapses, they were doing badly at the end of two weeks as a group that had, had a day and a half of no sleep. So really quite badly. And it's probably going to get worse if you follow this, this graph up. So, bottom line, our brains need at least six hours sleep to be kind of match fit. But the more intriguing thing to me was this. This is a, a, a test of sleepiness. This is, a, is, a, this is a, a questionnaire, an American questionnaire, that basically says, are you sleepy? And you get a score. So this is a subjective sleepiness. Do you actually feel sleepy? And the group that were performing, uh, both, both groups actually, these groups were, were not performing at all well on the lapses. They didn't actually report being very sleepy. So there's this mismatch between between being objectively sleepy but not actually feeling sleepy. Now this is bad news, okay, because the DVLA, the driving authorities, think in their, in their minds that if you're going to be sleepy enough to be a danger at the wheel, you'll know about it. But actually, if you're chronically sleep deprived, you don't actually realise it and your brains aren't working very well, but you don't pick up the fact that it's all to, all to do with sleepiness. So I think that's a really important lesson. Um, so let's talk about sleep deprivation. Um, what happens with your brain and how do you, how do you pick it up? How do you measure Sleep deprivation. I mean, we, we see people who are, have bags under the eyes, who are yawning. People can recognise sleepiness, more or less, but how, but how do you actually measure it? Um, and just to drive over the point, too, that, it, it, you know, that subjective does not equal objective sleepiness. Um, eye blinks are a useful tip, uh, um, little clue sometimes. Um, the very first sign physically is, is that your eye will blink more slowly than average. So you can pick this up sometimes, a slow eye blink, but more frequent. Slow, but more frequent. Um, you might be aware of this, but if you measure your pupil diameter, um, it becomes unstable if you're at all sleepy. And this can be used as a, as a measure. It's used in the States a bit, but it's a, it's a bit of a bit of a faff and hard to do in clinic. But your pupils become a bit random if you're sleepy. Um, the way we do it, if we wanted to do it, is, is a very clumsy way, actually. We actually get people to fall asleep and measure how quickly they fall asleep. And if you had no sleep, you will fall asleep uh, pr the previous night. You will fall asleep in about three minutes. It should take at least a quarter of an hour. So that's our rather clumsy way of measuring sleepiness. It's, it's a very bad gold standard. But other things go on. It goes beyond sleepiness. So we become slower. So every hour and a half we're short of sleep, our brain will age by about 10 years in terms of our reaction times. Um, the real thing in, in, in a real life situation that's important is this, vigilance. So we can't keep up our attentional uh, processes. So you can wing it, but you can't keep it up. You can't stay alert. You can't stay vigilant. You, you just can't do it. You'll have lapses. Uh, and the brain has to work harder. So you, you, people who are a bit sleep deprived can do simple tests. They can do mathematical equations. They can solve crossword puzzles. But they can't keep it up. And their brains work harder in order to do these tasks. And again, coming to the real world, these lapses that were picked up on the graph I showed you uh, are really important. Microsleeps, that's defined as a little three-second period where your brain is switched off. Um, so the lights are on, but no one's home. Your eyes can be open with these but you're just not able to, to react to the external world. These are really important for driving in particular. And I'll show you a little video, if it works, of a cabbie who was being filmed uh, in the States, in New York, I think it was, as they all are, apparently for security reasons. And this is him um, looking a bit sleepy. So heavy blinks, he's probably got sleep apnea, he's probably doing shift work, and he falls asleep about now, I reckon. So quite a graphical demonstration of having just a short microsleep, how, how it's not good. And the, the, uh, the DVA are 
they don't do it very well actually, but they're very aware how sleepiness can affect you behind the wheel. And uh, I say that the, the problem is they assume you will know you are sleepy, but you don't always know that. Um, again, I'm not going to blind you with neuroscience, but I'll just draw attention to, to this, this, this study by a guy called Jim Horn, who's quite a, um, uh, a doyen of, uh, of sleep medicine in the UK. He's, he's quite often in the media, he's retired now, but he's still quite a big force. And he produced this paper um, a few years ago now that essentially brought together all the evidence of experimental sleep deprivation, how it affects the way your brain works. And there are loads of things that go, that go wrong, actually, if you, if you study it. Uh, for example, it's, we are officially grumpy if we're sleep deprived. We officially lose our sense of humour on the Pittsburgh humour scale. We are nastier people. We are greedier. We are more impulsive. We are more likely to gamble. Um, we are less emotionally intelligent if we're short of sleep. And this is probably all frontal lobe functions. The frontal lobe is a bit of the brain that controls our personality and thinking. This packs up, basically, if we're sleepy. Now, this paper uh, prompted me to do a talk about right about then, and I thought, hang on a sec, this all makes perfect sense. Bank traders, this was the cause of the, of the banking crisis in 2008. You know, they're all these young traders making stupid decisions, being nasty people. This is the ultimate cause of the ba banking crisis. So I gave a talk giving my theory, and it was only slightly frivolous. Um, at the same time, David Nutt, who's a big, um, big cheese in the world of psychopharmacology, came out with a theory that the, the banking crisis was caused by cocaine misuse or, or abuse. And of course, our two theories are not mutually exclusive. But um, you know, people making decisions with no sleep or in the middle of the night, like the other day when, when um, Theresa May was whisked off to wherever it was, uh, Germany or France, in the middle of the night to announce the breakthrough in Brexit, 4 a.m. What's that all about? How, how, how is she going to be functioning? At four in the morning, and what, what is the point of that? You know, so um, doing night. We'll come, maybe come back a bit to night shifts, but making decisions on the night shift is a bad idea. Um, just one little paper to show you. That's quite amusing. Uh, uh, Matthew Walker, who I mentioned previously, he, the guy who wrote the book. Uh, this is one of his more simple experiments. So these are quite apparently um, well used in, in psychology circles. So you have to spot when this face becomes uh, a particular emotion. You know, from neutral to happy, I guess. <laughs> and you've got to spot which slide it becomes happy. Now, if we're short of sleep, we're not so good at spotting the emotion on these faces. And this has been well proven now, particularly in women, apparently. Women are less good at spotting angry and happy if they're short of sleep. But they have a good nap, and it all gets better. So we, we're less emotionally in tune if we're at all, at all sleepy. But in the real world, this is the issue. It's chronic lack of sleep. So chronic, you're a bit less than you really need, or bad quality sleep, you know, over months and years even. What are the consequences? Well. They're pretty dire. I don't want to scare you better. These things have been linked, associated with lack of sleep. So lots of population studies where you either measure or ask people how much they're getting, and then you draw a correlation. And these things are pretty well sh proven now, to be honest. So blood pressure, high blood pressure, depression, lack of immunity, so flu vaccinations are less effective if you're chronically short of sleep. Cancer. Now, cancer is an interesting one. The Danish government, about must be 15 years ago now, gave all their workers' compensation who've been doing shift work for 20 years, I think it was, uh, because the, the risk of getting breast cancer by doing shift work for 20 years was really sky high. And they've said that it's so convincing the data that we're going to give you all compensation. So that we're under the radar a bit. But increased cancer links in with lack of sleep. We'll come back to diabetes, but that's getting well proven. Uh, lack of sleep will fuel diabetes. Um, I'm not going to blind you with science here again, but these... these what are called meta-analyses. So these look at thousands and thousands of people. And the bottom line is little, little, little diamond at the end here. And this, these data tell me that your chances of having coronary heart disease if you're sleeping six hours or less are up by 50%. And that's big, you know, striking data. And again, the diabetes massive meta-analysis, as it's called, if you have bad sleep maintenance, or you're not very good at staying asleep, the risk is 84% higher uh, of getting the diabetes. Now, you may say, well, that's all with diabetes, you know, you're getting up to pass water or whatever, that's why you've got rubbish sleep. But actually, if you keep someone short of sleep experimentally, within four days, you see the very first signs of diabetes. So this is not just an association, it's probably a, you know, a causative effect. Um, this may surprise you, mortality. Lack of sleep correlates with, more, with increased mortality. So this study came out a while ago now, uh, a quite impressive study of over a million people who have been surveyed for a cancer survey in the, uh, in the, in the States. And the bottom line is, if you report certainly five hours or less, your chances of dying six years down the line when they went back to see how you were doing was like 20, 30% higher than it should have been. Now, 
I won't skim over this bit of the graph here, but if you sleep for nine hours, 10 hours, you also have an increased mortality. What's that telling us? I think that's telling us that these people are, have bad quality sleep. So they're sleeping for nine hours, 10 hours, but it's not good sleep. So they are effectively sleep deprived. But certainly six hours and less, um, you don't survive uh, as long as you should do. And about a fifth of us report, it's American data, but at least a fifth of uh, American people and probably British people do have six hours or less a, a night. Yeah, sure. Um, so on the right there, you, your uh, mortality increases with too much sleep. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. yeah that's the <laughs> this, you may think that, that bl blows a hole in my argument, but this comes back to the quality of sleep. So if someone's a severe snorer, for example, and they're stopping breathing in their sleep, they won't be aware of that necessarily. And so they'll go to bed at 9 o'clock and get up at 8 o'clock, so 11 hours sleep, let's say, but they'll feel rubbish. They'll have dry mouth. They won't get the deep sleep. You know, those, those big brain waves I showed you, the deep, slow wave sleep, they, they don't get that. So effectively, they are sleep deprived. So I think these, these data here are telling us that these people have bad quality sleep. So they're getting lots of it, but it's not good. It's how, how I would interpret those, those data. Now, from my angle, from a brain angle, I think this is really important. So dementia. Um, uh, there's good data now that tell us that one of the very first signs of dementia is a sleep, a sleep problem, a lack of sleep or a sleep fragmentation um, as an early sign of dementia. But... Equally, I think if you can force a brain to have good sleep, there's a good chance you can prevent, not prevent dementia, but certainly slow it down. And there's lots of animal data now that, that uh, support this idea, that if you can really focus on, a sleep, on sleep overnight and improve it or uh, enhance it, you will actually slow down the dementia process. So watch this space. Five years down, down the line, I reckon this will be a, a standard sort of fact. Um, I, I won't show you much in the brain scans, but these were people who had a severe sleep problem called sleep apnea and their brains are all a bit shrunken. Um, uh, the grey cells were certainly not as, as apparent in people who had severe sleep apnea. So I talked a bit about sleepiness and lack of sleep. What about insomnia? Um, this is my, my, my allegedly funny slide. Now insomnia is um, a bit of a loose term obviously. I mean it just means bad sleep. Um, now, I don't see people, or I try and avoid people, like I don't really treat them very well, who have what I call primary insomnia. Now, these are people who just cannot sleep. They're just over-aroused generally. So their brains will not relax, they will ruminate, they can't switch off, they just can't sleep. And we all have that every now and then, acute insomnia. But some people are wired up to have chronic insomnia. So there's a trigger, a bereavement, a childbirth, something that triggers off acute insomnia. But with these people, it never goes away. So you take away the trigger, but they remain insomniac. These are a different ball game to the people that I try and treat because the best treatment for that sort of insomnia is behavioural therapy. Because these people who get, say, four hours of sleep because they can't de-arouse, they, they will never sleep in the day. They'll say, I'll say, well, you, you, so you feel rubbish, but can you have a nap in the afternoon? Oh, no, I can never nap. So these are what I call primary insomniacs. They're, they're quite common and they're out there. But the ones that I try and, uh, and sort out are people who have what I would call secondary insomnia. So there's a reason why they're not sleeping, something you can potentially reverse. Um, and I use the word sleep toxin, um, something that's toxic to sleep. Um, so there's loads of things that will do this. And I mentioned before that things out there will degrade your deep sleep into light sleep. And you can, medical causes, uh, having to pass water at night, pain is a very prominent sleep toxin. Lots of things that I see, some rare things here. Psychiatric causes, you know, um, uh, the drugs in particular, the drugs people use to treat psychiatry are really toxic to sleep. They give you bad quality sleep in general. So without going into details, there are loads of little things out there that people might, might not be aware of, but degrade your sleep quality. Come back to the drugs, maybe it, GPs in particular might give you a drug that makes you a bit drowsy, and they think, oh, well, this mu it must be good for sleep. But often the opposite is it gives you bad sleep. So if you have a Valium, uh, you won't feel great in the morning. It'll give you rubbish sleep in terms of quality, come back to quality sleep. So the idea of sleep toxins that can affect sleep quality, um, uh, you may have more of it, but it's not good sleep, so you don't feel refreshed. I just want to show you two little brief slides about two common sleep, sleep disorders that, that, um, that come through the sleep clinic. This thing called OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, and restless leg syndrome that you may or may not have heard of. So sleep apnea, this is out there. This generally affects people of this sort of shape, but not always. Um, usually male. Uh, the, 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 the big risk factor is having a, a thick neck. So 17 inches or more, you, you know, you're a sporting chance of having a bit of sleep apnea. Um, but people I see in clinic have, have receding chins, that's a posh name for receding chins, or large tonsils, especially in children. And it affects probably you know, one in 25 people, uh, middle-aged men uh, in particular. 
Um, and essentially, this is severe snoring. So when we snore, the snore is due to the vibration of our palate. Um, but if it's a real severe snore, it sticks together. You, you obstruct your breathing. So effectively, during sleep, when you become floppier, it gets worse and you literally stop breathing. And people can do this 100 times per hour. Uh, and it kind of half wakes you up. Your body picks up, you're not getting any oxygen, so you kind of half arouse, your heart rate goes up. You might actually wake up, but you kind of make a gasp and go into light sleep, and the whole thing cycles and cycles, and say so 100 times an hour is not that uncommon. And it, it's, it's really bad for your sleep quality, and it puts up your blood pressure and everything else. You have dry mouth in the morning, you might have to pass water at night, all made worse by, by booze. And it's quite easy to confirm it. You put a thing on someone's finger, it measures their oxygen overnight in, in their blood, and you see these dramatic dips through the night as they stop breathing. So it's quite easy to diagnose, and you can measure the severity of it. And you treat it by weight loss, or you advise weight loss, but that's quite hard to do sometimes. Uh, but the best treatment are these masks. You may be familiar with these masks. They, they basically act like a splint. They give air under pressure and kind of divide the, the palate so you can breathe without uh, snoring at night and without sleep apnea. Um, surgery used to be quite popular. People used to fry away the back of throats with lasers. Uh, we, we, le we do that less. It doesn't work, actually, so we, we tend not to go down the surgical route. It's very, it used to be a cure, but my, my theory was that the cure was because people never came back. It's so painful they didn't come back to their doctors because they just ran away, basically. So, but but it, it doesn't work. So these, these masks are the best treatment when it's there, and it's definitely worth treating. It's very rewarding to treat. People have the best night's sleep they've had for years, and so they come, they give you hugs and everything, bake you cakes. Don't forget kids, because kids have this, not infrequently, big, fat, juicy tonsils, and this is a really common cause of severe snoring and sleep apnea in children. And again, you'll measure it with these little gizmos that measure the blood oxygen. So this kid here is having the dramatic dips in the oxygen through the night. This probably corresponds to dream sleep, because uh, in dream sleep we are particularly floppy, so particularly prone to having obstructions when we're in dream sleep. And if you, again, a, a, a graph, I'm afraid, but um, if this, this little kid here, um, this is what's called a, a growth chart. Um, so this kid is, is bimbling along here at the low end of the, of the scale, so a bit of a runt, you might say. Uh, has his tonsils out, and off he goes. He starts to grow. And this is probably due to growth hormone. When we go into deep sleep, um, in the first hour of deep sleep, our growth hormone is secreted. So if you're not getting deep sleep, you don't get this growth hormone surge, so you don't, you don't grow up, basically. Um, so it affects your physical development, but also, uh, almost certainly, your brain development. If you're not getting proper sleep, uh, it has to affect the way your brain develops in early childhood. So don't forget kids, they're, they're, they're out there. Moving now to this other condition that's very common but has a silly name, restless leg syndrome. Um, so I'm, there's, there's a good chance a few of you will have this every now and then. It's common in pregnancy. Um, but we see people have it really badly. So there's a spectrum from mild to severe. So we see severe people have this, yeah, this that re re wrecks their lives actually. It goes under-recognised by GPs, partly because it's got a silly name, and partly because it's so common that yeah, everyone's got a bit of it. Um, it. More common if you have a bit of nerve damage. It's much more common if the levels of iron in your body are low, if you're anemic in particular, or you have a kidney problem. And the way to diagnose it is, is this little acronym here, URGE. So you have to have a, a need to move your legs around, or your arms sometimes. It's worse if you sit down in the evening. Um, if you rest, it's brought on by rest rather than moving around. It gets better if you move around or rub the legs. And I say it's much worse in the evening when you're trying to sleep. So it often really wrecks nocturnal sleep. And I quite like this little video of, a, of, a, of an American guy who's being filmed with the restless legs, if you can hear the commentary. Next we'll be showing a video. This, this video shows uh, a patient that has restless legs syndrome and periodic limb movements during sleep. It's actually fast forwarded, so you can see how distressing this could be to, to uh, a person in terms of affecting both himself and the dead partner, as well as impacting on the quality of life. And this is a very treatable condition, okay? So uh, if it's right, recognized and diagnosed, we think we can treat it. So, out of interest, anyone here, does it ring any bells with anyone here? Anyone got restless legs? Uh, it, it really, and you can see really that common. He's, he's um, moving around continuously. He's using a pillow to actually prevent his, his legs from hitting each other. I say one of the problems is that it's got a silly name. The people that, are, uh, that run the RLS Society are trying to rename it as willis Eckbaum disease, give it a bit more kind of a currency uh, after the people that first described it, but um, it's certainly out there. Um, I'll whistle the slide. Aging, natural aging or normal aging or maturation, shall we say, uh, is a, a real issue for sleep quality sometimes. Um, so we, 
we seem to become less good at sleeping as we age. So this idea of sleep efficiency. So um, if you're a young person, you would expect to spend at least 90% of the time in bed asleep. By old, and this changes as I mature, but by old, I mean over 75, say, uh, it, less than 80%. So we become less good at sleeping. We pick lots of little arousals up. If we measure the brain waves, we just, our sleep becomes tatty with age. And this, the good stuff I mentioned, these slow wave uh, sleep, they're called delta waves, the slow wave sleep, the good stuff. Um, this is a young person, have love, lovely bursts of deep slow wave sleep, and a normal person in their 50s here, it's rubbish, it really goes off with age. So uh, the quality of our sleep goes out the tubes with age, and we can measure this from age 25. And I would argue this is the earliest biomarker of aging, it's lack of quality sleep. Um, we also become less, less good at sleeping if we're doing shift work or have jet lag, we're less good at, at falling asleep as we age. Um, this, this idea that if you're elderly you're allowed to be sleepy, that is a, a misnomer. People who are old shouldn't be sleepy. Uh, you're allowed to have a nap in the afternoon, but you shouldn't be sleepy. Sleepiness is not a natural association of, of, of natural ageing. Uh, another little thing to mention too, our clocks change as we age. I mentioned the clock a bit earlier on. Um, now the average teenager will want to go to bed at midnight or even later and will want to lie in until about 10 o'clock in the morning. That's their natural clock mechanism. But as we age, every decade, our clocks will shift by half an hour. So it's normal to want to go to bed about, say, 10 o'clock when you're in your 60s, 70s, and get up about 6 o'clock. It's not being boring or lifestyle. It's a natural clock thing. So our clocks do change a bit with age. Uh, I, I read a theory about this the other day. I thought it was quite a nice theory that this comes from cave day, caveman days, um, when you had communities or families all live together. And it made natural sense if each member of the family set a slightly different time. So, you know, to protect them from saber-toothed tigers or whatever might be prowling around. So the idea that young people went to bed later and, and the older went to bed a bit earlier to kind of cover the, 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 you know, the, um, uh, the day, as it were. I quite like that idea as a, as a theory. So in the last five minutes, uh, I'll just take you a few some, well, I think, quite interesting cases that, um, that have come through the clinic. Or at least, well, one, one's a patient of mine, the others are just examples of what we see. So this is a woman who's 39 years old and... Um, She's very interesting for lots of reasons that I won't go into, but she presented three years ago with collapses, was the presenting problem uh, from the GP. A year's history of frequent collapses. Uh, three times a day, um, she would fall to the ground when in severe ones, but little ones, her neck would just go a bit floppy, she couldn't keep her neck up. She'd just become a bit like jelly. Um, and these were triggered by laughing, um, uh, joking around, seeing someone she hadn't seen for a while. It's a, a very clear trigger with, uh, with emotion, with nice emotions usually. Um, very rarely negative emotions. Um, now, this one wasn't sleepy, um, although she should have been, but if you go through her story, she could, she'd never watched films all the way through, and I think it's a quite a good question to ask people. Do you, do you usually, uh, are you able to watch films without falling asleep, generally speaking? And uh, people that have a sleep disorder look at you strangely. I've never seen a film all the way through. Um, the other question is this I quite like. If you're a passenger in, in a car, on a long journey for more than an hour, say, would you generally fall asleep? That's a good little criteria, a benchmark, if you like, for people who are sleepier than they should be, and they might not realise it. Um, so she, she ticked both those boxes. She had quite good overnight sleep. She had this thing called sleep paralysis sometimes, where she couldn't move. Uh, okay, one in 20 people will have this every now and then. Uh, it's quite a frightening thing. So you, you come out of sleep and you're paralysed for a few seconds, quite scary. So that was in the background, but her dreams weren't particularly vivid or unusual, so there's nothing majorly wrong with, with her overnight sleep. Nothing in the family, no background of sleepwalking, parasomnia it's called. And we scanned her brain, well, I think it had been scanned by then, her brain scan was normal for what it's worth. And here's a nice video of her um, having one of her typical collapses. Whoops. So uh, I challenge you to understand this woman. She's got the broadest Teesside accent I've ever, ever heard, and I, I still can't really translate this. They're laughing about someone's name. And this is her having a typical attack. And no me at the back here, we'll, we'll get this straight away. This is, a, this is a classical example of what she has. And I'll, I'll tell you what it is at the end. But this is a really nice example of her mucking around. Uh, 
Okay, so I went and start name by asking what that was, but that's a classic example of a thing called cataplexy. So what's happening is she's getting a descending paralysis. So it starts in her head and descends over about three seconds to involve her whole body. So she lies on a heap on the, on the floor. She's conscious. She hasn't blacking out. She knows what's going on. She's just simply paralysed. And this is the absolute cardinal symptom of narcolepsy. This condition where people fall asleep uncontrollably, but they also have this thing called cataplexy. So in REM sleep, in dream sleep, we are totally paralysed. And the reason we don't really understand still, in this phenomenon here called cataplexy, the REM sleep process kicks in when we get emotional, when we're thinking about something funny or telling a joke. And this is a classical cataplexy. So by seeing that video and hearing her story, I can be totally confident she has narcolepsy. Um, I can also be confident too that she has a brain problem and her brain lacks a chemical. We now know that narcolepsy, thanks to William Dement's Doberman dogs, that she lacks a brain chemical that's got a name called hypocretin. So part of her brain has been, uh, has basically degenerated or been attacked by, by an autoimmune process. She's lacking about 60,000 brain cells out of 10 billion and she has a chemical deficiency. <coughs> Just by seeing that video, I can be totally confident about that. So that's a really good example of this thing called narcolepsy that affects one in 2,000 people. It's not a rare thing, but it goes under the radar. That's a, a, an extreme example. Um, the next thing I would just show you is sleepwalking. We see a lot of people who sleepwalk in the clinic, um, and the posture of this is called parasomnia. Uh, now, parasomnias can come from various bits of sleep. The commonest one is called a non-REM sleep parasomnia. That's the deep stuff, the good stuff I keep banging on about, the deep slow wave um, uh, uh, sleep. Um, and this is incredibly common in children, as I'm sure you'll be aware. So at least 50% uh, of children will sleepwalk fairly regularly, and it gets better with age usually. We, people grow out of it, you know, so it's quite uncommon for teenagers to sleepwalk. Uh, and, and I say re adults, it's rare. Actually, it's probably at least 1% of adults do still sleepwalk, although we, they don't come to the clinic with it. So it's not that rare. Um, but the trouble with adults is it gets a bit more complicated. So kids will just wander around aimlessly looking like little zombies. Um, benign sleepwalking, occasionally agitating, might leave the house and cause concern, but generally speaking, in children, it's just a bit of a family joke. Now, as we, if it persists into adulthood, it becomes a bit more complicated. So people, uh, men especially, tend to become what I would call uh, goal-directed. So they seek out food or violence or intimate activities in their sleep. So it becomes much more complex than simple sleepwalking. Um, I'm often asked, what's the most bizarre um, thing I've seen. Uh, uh, the, the loads of examples. A woman uh, last year uh, uh, bought a horse online in her sleep. Um, <laughs> totally bizarre. She had bought a horse in her wake the year before, so it wasn't totally out of blue sky, but um, texting and driving, all kinds of complex behaviour. Sleep eating is quite, quite common actually. People put on weight um, because they eat in their sleep. Um, there are various triggers for it. General, general stress will make it worse. If you're short of sleep, it'll make it worse. So night shifts, for example, often bring it out. If you're sleeping in a novel bedroom, so you're a bit uncomfortable to in a hotel room, that could be a trigger. And Travelodge, or one of the big chains now, regularly uh, lectures, lectures their staff on the issue of sleepwalking. Um, you know, people arriving naked in the, in, the la in, the, in the lobby, not uncommon. And one of the first things I tell patients is, this is hard to treat, but a, a rule of thumb, if you are sleeping in a hotel, wear pajamas. That's rule, rule one. Um, so here's a, a nice example of a sleepwalker. Um, this is... This is a woman. Now, w women tend not to be too aggressive in their sleepwalking episodes. This is probably about as bad as it gets. She has, she's a bit fruity in her language, a little bit agitated. But it's a lovely example, and it summarises all the features of non-REM sleep parasomnia. Um, so this is her. So I'll just get a foot in the stomach or wherever it's all, you know what I mean? And she just won't know what she's doing. 
I did warn you. Yeah. Like, say to yeah, you. Yeah, do sleepwalks. And then he was like, yeah, my sister sleepwalks, that's fine. And I'm like, no, really, I, I do. <laughs> as well as sleepwalking, Alex does a lot of sleep talking. Don't get a bitch on the fucking ass of me. Do you know what I'm doing? I love that West Country burr on the on the swear word there. So yes, yeah, so, so she's a typical sleepwalker. It runs in a family. Um, uh, it's worse. She's a bit stressed. As was, she just changed jobs to, to to fuel her recent worsening. Absolutely classical adult sleepwalker. So that's pretty bad. It gets in women. Now men are a slightly different ball game. So this is a uh, a chap in his early middle age. So again, a quite a typical agitated, aggressive parasomnia. And we don't really know what causes this. We assume it's a wiring problem because these people are going into deep sleep and then they're coming out of deep sleep and ending up in a halfway state somewhere between sleep and wake. So literally two thirds of their brains are awake doing quite complex stuff, but a third is asleep. So they're not voluntarily aware of it. They're acting on impulse, on goal-directed behavior. You can talk to these people, they, they won't remember it. Um, so it's really weird. And why some people are like that and other people are just wandering around aimlessly, sort of benign sleepwalking, we don't really know. And it's quite hard to treat. Um, we look for triggers, so people who are severe snorers, who are sleep deprived, who have restless legs, for example, are more prone to this. So we treat an underlying sleep disorder, but it's quite hard to treat. Drugs are sometimes helpful, um, but it's out there and one of the things that we see. So I'll draw to an end there. So to conclusions of this talk. So. Um, I never really answered the question, how much do we need, but seven hours. Seven hours is the kind of rule of thumb uh, figure for sleep need. Um, and that's got to be good sleep, not just rubbish sleep. People think we need less sleep as we age, but actually we, that's not really true. Maybe half an hour between 20 and 70. But um, uh, you, you need as much sleep when you're 70 as you do when you're in your middle age, certainly. So um, you need it, basically. Uh, and then. The, if you don't get enough of it, um, there are consequences that are really quite, I don't want to scare you, but they are quite dire. Um, and it's the slow wave sleep, these kind of dramatic um, sinusoidal brain waves that are the really important part of sleep in terms of restoration. Um, and if you're chronically sleep deprived, it goes way beyond the brain. With diabetes, I mentioned, but other things too are mucked up by lack of sleep on a chronic basis. Um, I like the idea of sleep toxins, the idea that things out there that will degrade your sleep quality. And these are often not recognised, even by, by doctors. So um, uh, pain, certain drugs, these will all degrade your sleep quality. Restless leg syndrome and certainly snoring and severe snoring. So there are things out there that, that will ruin your night's sleep and might not be recognised um, uh, at face value. And the thing that I get excited by is this. So if you improve sleep, if you pick up a sleep disorder or you treat someone um, who has, say, maybe early dementia or, say, Parkinson's disease, will you actually slow down the rate of progression of their underlying you know, degenerative condition. And I think, really think this will be um, a hot topic in, in the next few years. So if you, if you do a, a Google word map of ageing dementia, sleep will come up as, a, as a, a prominent element of it. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>